You're listening to the National Oceanography Center's Into the Blue podcast, where we tackle some of the biggest questions facing our ocean today by speaking to experts and voices from the world of oceanography. Hope you enjoy today's episode. Hi, I'm Will, and today I'm joined by Dr. Fatma Jebri and Professor Sarah Bernardini to talk about the role of artificial intelligence in observing our ocean. Thanks for joining us today. So before we get into the main subject, should we just talk a bit first about both of your sort of career backgrounds and how you came to NOC and what and what your position and what your role is at NOC. So Fatma, would you like to go first? Yeah, so first, thank you for having us. So I'm a senior researcher at the Marine Physics and Ocean Climate Group at NOC. Uh, I am a physical and satellite oceanographer by education, but what I really do is that study uh, how ocean physics affect the biology and life in our ocean. And in, in doing that, I use primarily satellite observations uh, that I combine with different kinds of data, anything that I can get my hands on, really. And I also use different methods like machine learning and AI. Um, then the second part of the question. Is this uh, sort of how your journey to NOC and how you Yeah, so how I got here. So I joined NOC shortly after my PhD in early 2018. Uh, but um, I would say uh, my career was not always um, oceanography oriented, so I started in math and physics. Then I went into engineering in meteorology, so more atmospheric sciences. But when I finished my engineering study, that's when I realized that it was research that I want to pursue. Um, but why oceanography? I guess I was <laughs> inspired by one of my professors who used to give this like general course on ocean circulation. And I got curious, and a few years later, here I am. <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah. Uh, so I am the principal research scientist in AI and data science here at the NOC. And uh, my role here is really to support the scientists like Batma to use the most cutting edge techniques uh, in AI to support uh, their research on the science of the ocean. And I'm also a professor of artificial intelligence at Royal Holloway, University of London. And uh, my expertise is um, in autonomous um, uh, systems and in particular in uh, autonomous decision making and so how uh, systems that could be embodied like robots or could be disembodied like uh, software agents uh, decide uh, what to do in order to achieve the goals that have been communicated uh, to them. How did I arrive uh, to the NOC? Well, I have been always uh, fascinated by studying uh, unknown spaces like uh, the deep space and uh, the ocean. And in fact, I started my career at NASA Ames uh, studying uh, the space. And in particular, um, we um, developed uh, a piece of software that uh, was um, used during the Mars Exploration Rover mission. And, uh, and so this uh, planning system was deciding what the rover was supposed to do on Mars to gather information. Um, and um, then I continued working on extreme environments and I um, uh, became particularly interested in missions uh, underwater. And uh, I realized that uh, uh, probably uh, the ocean is more mysterious than space. <laughs> they say that we know more about the moon than about the ocean. And, uh, and so then uh, I joined the NOC uh, with this uh, in mind. Great. Um, so on to main service of AI and artificial intelligence. Obviously, I think of, uh, the majority of our listeners have probably experienced AI, especially in the last few years, because it's sort of becoming such sort of key part of not only online world, but obviously how people live their lives as well. But I think a lot of people may not know how it relates to the ocean and research in the ocean and how we use AI mm -hmm. to essentially learn about the ocean to be able to do the research. So how, how, long, is, how long have we sort of considered AI as an option or, or, or a way of trying, sort of trying to observe the ocean, I guess, from a research and also an, an autonomy perspective? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, what I want to say is that when we talk about AI, this is such a, a diverse field, so there are a lot of techniques, and so when we say AI, we also uh, include machine learning, yeah. that is a sub-area uh, of uh, AI. And... Um, 
So I think uh, from the oceanography point of view, um, at some point, um, um, so many data uh, was uh, gathered uh, about the ocean, right, through many different, uh, um, you know, vehicles, but also in situ observations. And so at some point we had this uh, massive uh, databases and it was really impossible for scientists to analyze them manually. Right. And, uh, and so it, this is how how the use of AI became uh, really important uh, in oceanography. And so I would say that um, from uh, the start of 2000, uh, um, people started really being interested in using right. machine learning to the automatic analysis of, of data. And I would say that currently um, AI is used in three main areas. Uh, one is AI-based identification of uh, um, ocean phenomena. And so, for example, you can study oil spills, you can study, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, interesting uh, phenomena yeah. happening in, in the ocean. And then also uh, oceanic uh, phenomena uh, estimation. And, uh, and so you can try to analyze like waves, uh, you can try to um, um, have an estimation about different types of phenomena and then uh, also AI is heavily used uh, for uh, uh, the estimation of parameters that are right. used in many models. Uh, so yeah, I would say identification and prediction and estimations are the main three That's quite a areas. broad scope and in terms of yeah. covering so many areas. So mm. if we compare sort of AI and, that, and those that you've mentioned sort of more traditional, traditional methods, yeah. how do they differ and how, how does sort of the process of, of using those methods, yeah. how, how are they different? I think, so my answer to that is going to be, of course, from my personal experience because I am not an AI scientist, but I happen to use some AI methods yeah. and I specifically use machine learning and, and supervised machine learning more precisely. Um, so uh, in my experience, compared to traditional um, complex statistics or any kind of methods that we use to study the ocean, um, I guess one of the um, uh, main advantages is that um, AI techniques can help us um, tackle the challenges of non-linearity and complexity that ocean dynamic pose. Right. And when I say non-linear process, what I mean by that, it's um, a process that can change suddenly. It can develop in different direction at the same time. So right. to give an example, we can encounter non-linear ocean currents. Right. Uh, the other ad, uh, advantage, I guess, uh, some like machine learning methods would uh, offer a higher discriminative power, which means it can help us distinguish better between different clusters or patterns or relationships in our ocean data. Yeah. And uh, if we can do that and in a faster way while it reduces dimension, we can obtain more um, accurate or more precise yeah. uh, results. We can understand better what's going on in the ocean and in a faster way. Yeah, so, so I'm just going to say some of the speed of it obviously must help us be able to gain more data because we're doing yeah. the other ones that we're collecting so quickly, we can then carry on doing that at a much quicker pace. But it does require some computational yeah. power, of course, to yeah. do that. Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, are there any, are there any examples of, of projects that we've done recently or in the past that have, have sort of used AI and that have put that into practice? Um, yeah, so um, one like example that I, <laughs> I find myself, I like to talk about quite often, is how uh, we used um, unsupervised machine learning to help us identify what are the current mode that would typically affect the phytoplankton, which is like those tiny plants that yeah. we find in the ocean, how it affects phytoplankton availability in upwelling zones. And when I say upwelling, I mean it's the uplift of nutrients rich and cold water from depth to the surface. And to do that, um, uh, machine learning, so specifically the neural clustering self-organizing maps was really helpful because it helped us reduce 14,000 images to just 12 without losing the dynamics. And to me, to this day, it's still fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe also like uh, Sarah, like maybe I uh, can mention other examples. 
Yeah, for example, we use um, AI and uh, robotics uh, for monitoring biodiversity. So clearly biodiversity is in decline and so yeah. we need to try to tackle this uh, issue. And so we have um, a project at the Turing Institute uh, joined with um, NOC uh, in which uh, we try to study biodiversity by using autonomous vehicles. And uh, so we use these uh, vehicles to, to do some sampling um, in uh, areas that uh, we think will uh, provide a lot of information, but clearly these vehicles have limited autonomy, and so uh, they really need to plan carefully where they will go uh, to uh, sample uh, so that they can maximize uh, uh, the information gain. And so the robots uh, reason about uh, uh, you know a, a model of the world that is uh, created uh, both by using uh, uh, big data, but also is used uh, through more traditional techniques based on physics and mathematics and then it decides based on that uh, which areas to visit and uh, and then after making some experiments it can either confirm that the model um, that is using is accurate or it can uh, actually update it to reflect yeah. the fact that okay it went to that place and it really didn't found what it was looking for and so uh, the robots really need to be quite uh, smart in how they uh, operate in order really to, to, to maximize uh, information gain for, for the scientist. Right. So in terms of, obviously, there's sort of dynamics so with the science, then the, the autonomy. Is there like synergy between the two in terms of how AI uses that sort of data? Like, would it then be collected by the robots and then you'd be able to use the same method or is there sort of a mixing of methods almost? Yeah, I mean, I think there is um, quite a synergy because I w as I was saying, um, really the robots initially needs to have some prior knowledge yeah. of the, the phenomena that is trying yeah. to study. And those come from the scientists who tell us, uh, you know, how this phenomenon is supposed to, to work and then uh, based on that we plan the behavior of, of the robot and then we can feedback what we learn mm. about the phenomena so that uh, the knowledge of the scientists become more and more accurate right. so there is really a synergy between the two sides yeah that's great um in terms of so obviously ai is in all different areas seems to be sort of accelerating at a very quick pace in the last few years especially in the future of sort of how we, how we use AI in research and autonomy, do you see it, you know, moving forward at a much quicker pace or is it something that obviously, we've, as you said, we've been kind of using it as sort of a, an option since sort of the turn of the millennium? Do you see it going at a much quicker pace now and, and will it sort of be able to keep up with, you know, what we're doing and, and the science that we have, so say the autonomy? Will it be able to keep up with that or do you think it will sort of continue at a pace? I think for sure um, we are going to continue to use it. However, I think there are some open challenges that uh, we need to, to tackle. And one, for example, is the the challenge of explainability because uh, clearly um, you know we are all a scientist so we don't uh, believe in answers given by black box methods <laughs> and uh, many methods in AI for example are put based on deep learning um, really these techniques are quite uh, opaque at the moment um, and so we want to work with scientists really to open uh, the box in a way yeah. and make these uh, uh, techniques much more uh, transparent Parent. Yeah. And, and so I think this is one uh, important challenge. The second challenge that I see um, is for the um, for the machines that we build to uh, be um, I mean, to make sure that we uh, can build a machine that we can trust. And so uh, as the machine becomes more and more autonomous, more and more independent, we need to make sure that uh, we construct machines that are accountable, that can explain the line of behavior, and they can uh, negotiate this uh, line of behavior with uh, humans. And um, so already, I think in 1951, Alan Turing alerted us to the control problem and so to make sure we build a machine that we can control and yeah. I think uh, this is still an open area right. uh, that we need to to explore more. 
Yeah, and if I can add to that, um, yeah, about the control and the challenges that we would encounter in using AI or machine learning. So again, I'll give my perspective yeah. as an oceanographer. Yeah. Uh, I would say that one of the main challenges I encountered uh, was how to present our ocean data to the machine learning algorithms. Because uh, I think uh, for oceanographers, they were not necessarily looking to come up with a new AI or machine learning algorithms, but we're trying to figure out how to use them to address our own question. And it's not a straightforward, I found it's not a straightforward task. There is like a parameterization stage that you need to uh, kind of like guess with like test, trial, and run. Yeah and to, to find some sort of like an optimum choice. Um, so yeah, there is uh, that I think going forward into the future, um, if as a like both communities, like oceanographer communities and AI community, if we can like come together to uh, find like a solution to this challenge, I think it will help accelerate yeah. or the incorporation of AI in machine learning and ocean science in general. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. I think that the most exciting research is really at uh, the overlap between oceanography and AI. And mm. it's not about AI providing tools to oceanographer and the oceanographer just using those tools. Mm. I think it's about working together to also, uh, you know, come out with new techniques yep. for AI that then can be used in other, in other fields yeah. as well. And there are already some examples of, uh, you know, techniques that uh, were uh, really formulated to tackle um, oceanography problems that then have been used in finance, for example, or in other fields where there are similar challenges like non-linearity, as uh, Fatma was saying before, mm. or non-stationarity. Uh, so I think it's really exciting because we can kind of uh, um, cross-fertilize uh, our fields uh, uh, by, you know, uh, really coming up with new yeah. ideas. Yeah, and it's both sides benefiting from the, from the same, yeah. same yeah. research. I want to touch on digital twins for a minute. Obviously, we, we've covered digital twins in a previous podcast, and it's, it is a really exciting area of, of ocean research and, and development at the moment. So do you see AI enhancing how, what we're doing in the moment with digital twins? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think AI is uh, one of the crucial uh, ingredients in yeah. uh, digital twins. And... Uh, I think that uh, the digital twin, um, digital twins are going to be used for uh, as long as we can use them uh, to, for prediction and also to try to kind of unfold uh, future scenarios and then make decisions upon them. And so, for example, the area of autonomous decision making I was mentioning before will become very important, right? Because it's not that we only want a replica of uh, the world of the ocean uh, just in order to have a simulation. We already have simulations. I, yeah. mean, I think what uh, uh, we want from Digital Twin is this capacity to try to look into the future and to make decisions and to see how this decision can impact uh, people, can impact the environment, um, and then can help policymakers to make better decisions yeah. for the future. And AI is for sure very important uh, for um, you know, quantifying uncertainty, for uh, you know, creating more uh, realistic simulations. Yeah, great. So, should we finish off on sort of the only working on any projects at the moment that sort of involves AI? Maybe you can tell yeah. us a bit about them. Uh, yeah, so um, it's a it's a very recent project that just started called MISCAL, and it's about um, new methods to extend the coverage of the AMOC um, latitudinally and retrospectively. So the AMOC is the Atlantic Meridional Overturner Circulation, which is basically a system of currents that uh, regulate our um, global climate system through its associated um, fresh water, heat, and carbon transport. And what we uh, aim to do with uh, this project is try to reconstruct the AMOC backwards in time. And we aim to do that using the recurrent neural network, which um, work like um, short-term um, uh, memory. So they can um, uh, learn uh, from um, a previous uh, observation and then using uh, that knowledge uh, can be like uh, pro 
projected to understand what's going to happen uh, forward in time. So that's the principle, right. but we only use it to reconstruct the AMOC backwards in time. Right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Sarah, are you looking at anything? Um, anything to yes, about? so the NOC uh, is uh, part of this uh, new environment and sustainability grand challenge that has been launched by the Turing a few months ago. And so, in the context of this grand challenge, we are working on developing new AI methods uh, to tackle the uh, decline in biodiversity and also climate change. And so, we are working with uh, um, scientists. Uh, um, not only at the NOC, but also in other um, institutes uh, like uh, BAS, for example, yeah. or CFAS. So uh, it's really a, a good project because uh, it kind of brings together a lot of different um, uh, types of scientists and uh, to, to tackle these two important challenges of biodiversity decline and the climate change. And we are using a lot of uh, AI methods from deep learning to probabilistic reasoning and, and many other so it's quite exciting great and project. i'm very excited i think it's amazing to hear how how much of an impact ai is having across the board in terms yeah. of what of what not does and in ocean science in general not only like the autonomy side but also science and research i think it's really interesting and um yeah i can't wait to see how it, how it develops further but yeah thank you thank you both for joining me today thank you thank for you us. <laughs> yeah. thank you thanks if you're enjoying Into the Blue, please make sure you follow us on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. New episodes are released every other Wednesday on all major platforms and are also available to watch on the NOC's YouTube. See you next time.